Hi, it's Annie and Sam. We're, we are historical interpreters at Murney Tower for this summer. In honor of the month of May and the May long weekend that just passed, we are excited to do this workshop called High Tea at Murney Tower, which explores our collection of royal memorabilia. Annie and I have only been working at Murney Tower Museum for a short while, but it's incredible how much cool facts we have learned. I've lived in Kingston my whole life, and I knew a few things about Murney Tower, but I had no idea how interesting its history truly was. For example, I learned that Murney Tower has been a museum for nearly 96 years, but was built way before that in 1846. That's one old building. I know, and another interesting fact that I learned is that people, even families, actually lived inside the, of the tower. Right? And although I knew it was an important part of Kingston's identity, I had no idea that Murney Tower was also recognized around the world. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a National Historic Site, and one of the many Martello Towers around the world. Murney Tower Museum doesn't just focus on military history, though. There are actually a lot of domestic artifacts, which leads us to our Gardner collection, which we're going to talk about a bit today. The donor, Miss Alda Gardner, was a teacher in the Kingston area for over 30 years. Ms. Gardner was devoted to education and community service. She passed away, unfortunately, in 1978, and her collection was donated in her honor. It is truly our pleasure to display a part of the collection continuing Ms. Gardner's contribution to education and community service in Kingston. The collection has over 177 items, which includes books, souvenir medals, and glass and ceramic memorabilia that's particularly dedicated to Queen Victoria. Annie, I'm so happy that you're in charge of crafting projects like these. You're so creative. Are there any certain pieces that inspired you? Yes, there are a few pieces that inspired me to do this project. Let's take a look at them now. Queen Victoria Jubilee Commemorative Cup and Saucer, celebrating her 60 year reign, she reigned for 63 years in total, is one of my favorites. She had the longest reign as sovereign in British history before our current Queen Elizabeth II. It's decorated with gold leaf and, trans and a transfer printed design painted over by hand. It has a circle surrounded by floral decoration which involves the olive branch, a shamrock, a Scottish thistle, and a Tudor rose in a symbolic wreath. The loss of Victorian China actually had a romantic quality with florals and pastoral scenes. This other piece, the China mug with the royal arms of the United Kingdom, also has the same beautiful florals on its backside. These two pieces, among many others in this collection, actually have references to or have the royal arms. The royal arms we see today was actually adopted in 1837 as the official coat of arms of the British monarch, currently Queen Elizabeth II. The shield of the image is quartered with the three lions of England, the rampant lion of, and the counterfoy of Scotland, and the third, the harp of Ireland. The crest has the lion wearing St. Edward's crown on the left, and the other side has the Scottish unicorn. In the greenery below, the Scottish thistle, the Tudor rose, and the shamrock are depicted, like we mentioned before, and those represent Scotland, England, and Ireland. The, the royal arms demonstrate the connections between the sovereign and the different cultures that are in the United Kingdom. I was drawn to these pieces because of the detail and the delicate florals. On my first attempt at this project, I wanted to use the florals represented to show Ontario and Canada's, Canada's connection to Britain. So on my piece, I used the Scottish thistle, as depicted in the other pieces that we looked at, as well as the Tudor rose, or my attempt anyway, at a Tudor rose. <laughs> um, and then I wanted to do some shamrocks, and then to represent Canada, I did some maple leaves, and then the trillium, which represents our own province, Ontario. Another piece in our gardener collection is this commemorative saucer of Queen Elizabeth II's voyage down the St. Lawrence Seaway. With Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II written across the top, followed by images of the Queen and a visual of the St. Lawrence, this piece highlights the Queen's relationship with Canada. The yellow maple leaf represents Canada to the north, and the yellow eagle below the St. Lawrence represents the United States, United States to the south. What really drew me to this piece is, this del is its delicate gold details, and also the fact that it emphasizes how important the St. Lawrence Seaway really is to our history. As many people know, Kingston is located on the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Who knows, maybe if we can look hard enough, we can see Kingston on the plate. Annie, you mentioned earlier the idea of transfer painting. What does that mean exactly? So to mass produce the images you see on these antique ceramics, 
Many were made using a transfer printing technology that was actually started in the 1750s. Transfer printing involved the transferring of an engraved design on a copper plate using tissue paper or a glue bat onto a ceramic vessel. There are two primary types. So one is when you print over the final glaze, which is when your piece has been fired twice and it has this shiny sheen on it, or you apply it under the final glaze on the bisque fired piece. And if you're wondering what bisque means, and no, it's not the soup, <laughs> a bisque firing is when you fire it once after drying your vessel when it's formed into its final shape. And then you fire it a very relatively low temperature to seal the clay, and then you can glaze it. And then you put it in again to fuse the glaze onto your ceramic, so you fire it twice. So, so this allowed standardized decoration that could be created quickly and in larger quantities, and some potteries would even buy engraved plates made by professional engravers, or they actually had full-time engravers in their workshop, which popular designs would be sold to more than one manufacturer or with small changes made, so not everyone had the same design. Despite the fact that this technique of transfer printing under the glaze had been around for decades, it was actually not until after the War of 1812 that we started seeing it in America and Canada. So we should really get started on our craft. <laughs> Don't you think, Sam? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm That's excited. Cool. <laughs> so let's have some high tea at Marini Tower. <laughs> so what you will need, um, you'll need porcelain paint markers. So these markers, make sure when you buy them, they state that you can bake them in the oven and that they work on porcelain. Because when you bake them, it makes them food safe. So you can drink from your cup and have tea in it and it won't rub off, so it has great longevity. Next, you would need a piece of glazed ceramic, and like we said before, you want it to be fired twice and have that shiny sheen, so it's a finished piece. You don't want the plain ceramics that you would have at like a paint your own ceramic shop. You want the nice smooth finish so that your marker seals on properly. Um, you might want a toothpick or a Q-tip in case any of the marker paint pools on the surface because you don't want it to distribute more ink just to wipe off. Yeah, that, that's completely up to you. Um, you will need your oven, so you might want some parental supervision when doing this part. So always make sure to ask your parent to help you bake your piece when you're finished. Um, paint clothes or a covered work surface if you're worried about some mess. The markers aren't too messy, but you always want to be safe. Um, and of course, you might want the instructional package that's posted on MerneyTower.com or this video demonstration with me and Sam. So now we're going to go through the process of starting your craft. So make sure you cover your surface to keep away any mess. Make sure your piece is nice and clean before you paint. Um, get your markers, make sure they're well shaken and test them out on a scrap piece of paper to make sure the paint flows well. and. You know, don't be afraid of making mistakes. This is meant to be a nice, fun craft. If anything, it'll just wipe right off while you paint. So don't worry too much because it won't be sealed on until you bake it. So Sam, what are you going to do for your design? Well, I really was inspired by the Queen Elizabeth II and St. Lawrence Se Seaway piece, just because it kind of represented Kingston more locally. But I was thinking about doing something maybe a little bit similar to that, um, but representing modern day Kingston or modern day Canada rather than, you know, a couple a couple centuries ago or so. So yeah. That's really cool. Um, since my first piece I tried out originally, as we all saw, was all floral themed. I think I'm gonna do one that's now more related to Murney Tower more closely. So I'm gonna do a commemorative Jubilee cup like we spoke about before with the museum on it. And I'm gonna mention how the museum's turning 96 this year, which is amazing of it being open to the public. So I'm gonna make Murney Tower's own Jubilee commemorative cup and saucer. Awesome, so, I can't wait to see it. Let's get started. So, hey Sam, how far in are you, are you with your design? Like what do you have so far? Um, well, I've been working a little bit on the saucer. I have um, an indigenous medicine wheel some pine trees that I'm still kind of, you know, building up a forest around my plate here, and then uh, the Canadian flag. So this is all I have so far, but uh, yeah, how about yourself? So I haven't started my saucer yet, <laughs> but I did my mug. So I have a little Murney Tower with a maple leaf wreath around it, kind of oh. like the wreath we talked about in the Jubilee Cup. So this wow. is as far as I've gotten so far in my little 
Yeah. You're, like, you're a true artist. It looks so good. So are you. I mean, I'm trying. <laughs> oh, Annie, I was thinking when I was, as I was decorating my plate, um, do you have any favorite facts about Queen Victoria, seeing as it is, you know, Victoria Day? Well, I love Queen Victoria's dedication to her pets throughout her life and especially her dedication to her dogs. As you can see, my apron in the background has dogs on it. <laughs> um, during her childhood, she owned a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named Dash. We know about him because she wrote about him extensively in her journals as a child. Uh, he features in one of her childhood portraits holding her gloves in his mouth. Uh, two years before her coronation in 1838, she received an adorable oil portrait of Dash for her birthday. It was done by the great animal painter, Sir Edwin Lancier, and it shows the pink ribbon he seems to have worn around his neck. Because according to some stories, she used to dress Dash up at Kensington Palace like many pampered and adored pets you see around today. He also features in a group painting by Lancier that's now at Clarence House that shows Dash with, with her greyhound named Nero and the Scottish deerhound Hector and a parrot named Lori, which we, we could imagine her pets and especially these dogs grouped in front of the fireplace at the Royal Dining Room at Clarence House where the painting hangs today. The current queen thought it too beautiful to move. Uh, I've always felt connected to Queen Victoria because of her love of her pets and dogs. And I actually have the same breed of dog named Clementine, which I'm gonna grab for everyone because she's the best. As you can see, here's Clementine. <laughs> um, and I guess you could say Clementine is my favorite Spaniel. <laughs> so that's my favorite fact about Queen Victoria. <laughs> that's so fascinating. You're so knowledgeable, knowledgeable about uh, Queen Victoria's little dog there. That's so cute. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not as knowledgeable about Queen Victoria as you are, um, but I would say that one of my favorite facts would be how Victoria facts, favorite Queen Victoria facts would be that she kind of appealed or she kind of dressed herself up to be not just, you know, a wife to the king, but also a wife to the nation. And oftentimes when she had public outings, she would go out wearing a bonnet rather than a crown um, to make her appear, you know, kind of more like, like a regular person. Um, as well, another fashion fact about Queen Victoria is that after the death of her husband, she often wore all black. And the most notable time that she wore um, all black as a widow was during her Jubilee procession. So, you know, talk about a fashion statement. Anyways, we're going to continue our little designs here and we'll get back again and show you how far we get. All right, Annie, here's an update on my design so far. I've added, you know, the different landscapes of Canada. We got the prairies, the mountains, some snowflakes, some mittens, <laughs> have a little maple syrup <laughs> container, and of course, a nice hot mug of coffee. How's yours going? I guess, so to make mine like one of those cute matching sets, I kind of copied my little wreath and I put it on my saucer with some designs to make it, oh, wow. you know, matchy. So I'm going to do the back next, I think, and I'm going to put some gold trim on it next since a lot of our pieces have gold leaf and there is a metallic gold marker in my set. So I'm going to try to give it that like teacup gold on it next. So that's my plan. Awesome. <laughs> so I was thinking about it while I was coloring in my leaves here. Um, why do we still celebrate Queen Victoria now if it's been so long since she reigned and why is it really important to Mernie Tower like why are we speaking about it like how does it relate to our little museum yeah so I've been thinking a lot about that as well um and so the monarch's birthday has actually been celebrated in Canada for centuries the first year of the celebration that was originally dedicated to Queen Victoria was in 1845 which was actually one year before Mernie Tower was built as I said these celebrations dedicated to the king or queens of the past were primarily a military ce celebration rather than the civic holiday we see today. On this day, military men would engage in mandatory annual training, and then they would parade to local taverns and alehouses, toast and toast to the king or the queen. It's easy to imagine the military men of Murney Tower participating in similar rituals until it closed in 1885. Today, the tradition is carried on and the holiday has become more of a public celebration. 
But what I don't know is why we even celebrate Queen Victoria in the first place. If she's no longer queen, why is this holiday still named after her? Well, after Queen Victoria died, it remained a public holiday on the 24th of May, even though other parts of the world celebrated it as the Empire Day originally. Canada, however, honored Queen Victoria because Canada sees her as the mother of confederation who encouraged Canadian unity and self-government. Even after Queen Elizabeth's ascension in 1953, it's celebrated as the Queen's official birthday in Canada, but it's still called Victoria Day, which honored her unique contributions to Canadian Confederation, which is really cool. <laughs> so I think we are going to start doing the rest of our designs and we'll be back again to show you an update. Annie, do you have any special Victoria Day celebrations? Well, when I was a kid, my family would always do fireworks in our backyard. My grandpa would always buy like the biggest and baddest ones you could get. Um, we'd always have like barbecue or like a big meal. And, you know, possibly we'd go to into an event in our town as well, which usually comprised of fireworks or a little festival. How about you? What did you and your family do? Well, growing up, we had a cottage. So we used to, you know head to the cottage it was kind of like the first big weekend and of course lots of fireworks and visiting with family and friends we hadn't seen kind of just celebrating the fact that uh summer was almost here <laughs> and that uh we could look forward to a summer on the lake so that's what we got up to that's cool um in doing this project i recently found out that the original victoria day traditions were not so far removed from ours um, in 1841, the new legislative assembly for the province of Canada were actually looking for ways to create unity in the country between the French and Canadian, sorry, the French Canadian and the English Canadians. So one common cultural trait they all had, of course, was their love for the crown, which set them apart, especially from the US at the time. So in 1845, it was declared that the queen, the current queen Victoria's birthday, May 24th, was now a public civic holiday rather than it being strictly for the military. So a civic holiday was born. That's so cool. Throughout the 19th century, the celebration also became wildly popular, both as an acknowledgement of the royal family, but also just, as I said, in celebration of the warmer summer months. The first most notable public civilian celebration happened in the year 1854 in Toronto. 5,000 people gathered outside the government house to toast to the holiday. And then by Confederation in 1867, both Ontario and Quebec would engage in day-long celebrations filled with parades, picnics, fireworks, and even athletic competitions. It's pretty much the same. <laughs> That's really yeah. cool. So well, am I done? I think so. I was just about to say, I think I'm just about finished here. Uh, what are the next steps? Well, since I'm just pretty much done too, my design now has a cute Jubilee design, except for us, it's not our Jubilee, but since we're celebrating our 96 years of being open as a museum, I have a little inspired design from the Jubilee Cup I mentioned, saying celebrating 96 years. And then my saucer, I put Murney Tower Museum with 96 in the bottom with some gold. Well, I'm using some faux gold leaf. <laughs> using my metallic marker <laughs> so how about you sam like how's your design are you pretty much done yeah um i have my my saucer that i showed earlier i haven't added anything else to it um and i decided to you know kind of let my creativity take over i didn't really make a matching set i kind of just you know here I'll, there you go oh, that's so pretty <laughs> some fun designs and then i made a stripey little handle so being careful not to touch it so the marker doesn't wipe off Exactly. Um, so speaking of marker not wiping off, make sure you try not to touch the dried paint because like Sam said, it can rub off from your fingers, but don't worry, just reapply it if that happens. Uh, once it's completed, you have to let it dry for at least an hour. And then to make it permanent and fuse onto your porcelain, what you have to do is place your pieces on a baking tray and put it into your cold oven 
then you preheat your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. So make sure if you're doing this alone to have a parent help you if you need help with your oven. And then you have to make sure your pieces are inside the oven as it preheats. So you want your cold pieces to be in the cold oven. And as it preheats, they all warm together because you don't want to shock the glass because it might break. And after that, you let it bake for about 30 minutes. And then once the time has passed, you can either leave it in your oven, shut the power off and let it cool together, or you can remove it from your oven on the baking sheet. Do not touch the piece right away because the paint gets very wet when it gets hot and then it cures as it cools. So, so Sam and I are going to let our pieces dry and we're gonna bake it and we're gonna show you our final product and let you know and just give you our concluding thoughts. <laughs> so we'll see you again in a bit. So hi everybody, we're back after baking our pieces. So this is my finished product with the tower and some matching leaves on both the saucer. And then I have my little Jubilee com commemorative thing celebrating 96 years for the museum being open. And yeah, it, I think it turned out really nice. <laughs> yeah, my, my, mine came out of the oven. I'm really impressed actually by, by, by how well everything um, came out. Um, my cup also turned out very well. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy with how it turned out and I can't wait to start using them at tea time. But just remember that when you wash them after using them, I would recommend putting hand washing it instead of the dishwasher, just because the dishwasher wears dishware anyway over time. So it will just help you have it for a much longer time instead of it wearing out. So yeah. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us and so and helping us celebrate Victoria Day, the month of May, and our gardener collection. Remember that if you participate in our craft, you can send us pictures of your work, which will be focused on our um, sorry that will be featured on our social media. Um, you can also send images to our email at info at murnytower.com, or you can post your own photos on social media and use the hashtag. Hashtag high tea with Murney Tower. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye.